Hi and welcome to Covenant Life's online service. We're really glad that you're here. Before we start the service, for those of you who are here for the first time, we'd love to know you more. So please fill the newcomers form which is down there in the description and one of us will keep in touch with you through this week. Enjoy the service. Father, we love you, Jesus. It is a privilege, Lord. It is an honor, Lord, to worship you, Jesus. And to see you, Father, for who you are, Lord. You are good, Lord. You are good, Father. Jesus, in all the days of our lives, Lord, you've always been good, Lord. Jesus, oh, we worship you, Lord, and we thank you, Father, for your goodness, Lord.
so good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh. to us, Lord. No matter what has happened to us, Lord, your goodness still remains the same, Lord. It never changes, it never wavers, Lord. It's always the same, it's always constant, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Jesus. Yes, Lord.
sing that one last time. Surely your goodness, Lord, will follow us. Surely your goodness and mercy to follow me all my days. I'll sing it. Surely your goodness and mercy to follow me. Take our hand, Lord, and teach us to do that, Lord. To take us by the hand and lead us from this valley of the shadow of death to the green pastures, to the gentle and beautiful meadow where we can drink from your spring of life, Lord, so that we may never thirst, Lord. So come on and hold us, Lord, and lead us. Because we want to experience your goodness once again, Lord. We want to know your experience, your, your goodness. And we don't want just to go back to our experiences, but Father, we want to know it once again that you hold us by the hand. Welcome back. Let's look into God's word. Let's invite our speaker for this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for God's word in our hands, in our language for us. I want to thank you, Lord, that this morning you have something on your heart that you want to speak to us about and that you, Lord, are going to get through regardless of my limitations, their distractions, and no matter what happens today. I trust you. I trust your word. I trust your word to always bear fruit. And I thank you for the opportunity and the honor. Give your servant the task and skill to be able to get out of the way so your people might find themselves face to face with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We've been in a series that we've been really enjoying and it has moved and touched many hearts. Some of you have responded and uh, reached out for help. And we are so grateful to God for this thought, for this guidance in, in, in taking up these uh, these issues and these themes. We're talking about how to hold God's hand. How to hold God's hand when you're going through troubled times. How to hold God's hand when you're healing from abuse. And today, I want to take up the concept of God's presence. How to hold God's hand when you want to sense His presence. How to hold God's hand when you want to sense his presence. I hope you have a Bible with you, but even if you don't, the scriptures will be on the screen. And today we're looking at a lot of beautiful scriptures. And I trust that you'll allow every scripture to kind of just uh, melt into your into your mind and heart and kind of really just settle in. All right. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this morning's uh, sermon with you. So this is part three. Let's begin with a very specific scripture in Psalm 139, verse 9 and 10. It's on your screens. If I take the wings of the morning. Beautiful poetry. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will hold me. Your hand shall lead me. Your right hand will hold me. Let's do that again, all right? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. What a beautiful psalm. What a beautiful. I want, you, I want you to think back. 
Think back to when you were a child. Do you remember? What it was like to hold your dad's hand. I love those pictures where you have that little hand holding on to dad's finger or something like that. What did it do for you? What did you get from holding dad's hand? What did it mean to you? What do you miss about it the most now? In fact, who was holding whose hand? Was dad holding your hand or were you holding dad's hand? I, I remember those phrases that says, dad says, give me your hand. Or here, take my hand. Or hold on tight. Today, I want us to consider the truth that hand holding basically says, I'm here with you. Hand holding basically says, I'm here with you. I'm present. I'm here. That's what you do when you assure someone of your presence. You touch them. You squeeze their arm. You take their hand. Parent to a child. Uh, a loved one. At the bedside of, of a hospital. Whenever you want to make your presence felt without words. And this morning, I want to talk about that. The tangible expression of presence is hand holding. And God says, I will hold your hand. My right hand will guide you. I will take you by the hand. And you get into that mindset that God wants to make his presence felt to you and me. So today I'm challenging you and me to really appreciate and to take advantage of the fact that we have a God who wants to be present. Sometimes even loved ones, when conversation comes to an end, will just hold hands and sit, just to express that intimate presence. So how do you hold God's hand to sense his presence? How can we learn to enjoy being in God's presence, even when words run out? All right. Whenever I think of God's presence, my mind goes straight to this amazing psalm. Let me read it for you. Psalm 139. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your right hand shall hold me. Your right hand shall lead me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light uh, about me be maybe be night, even there, then the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day to you. The darkness is a light with you. For you formed my inward parts. And you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. O oh Lord, my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you. Even when I was made in secret in my mother's womb, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, even when I had not lived a day. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. What a beautiful phrase. I awake and I'm still with you. Let me tell you two things. God is present to me. And I am present to God. God is present to me. He's always present to me. He's an ever present God. He's a doting father who steps into the room to check on me when I'm sleeping. Who steps into the room when I'm studying or when I'm when I'm playing outside. 
He comes out to check on me. He's always watching out to see if I need something, asking me to be careful. I'm awake and I'm still with you. From the womb to the workplace, God is there with you. Like a father doting on you, God is present with you. I'm not convincing you about that. I'm asking you to practice the knowledge of it. I'm not convincing you that this is real. You know it's real. But I'm asking you to step into that reality. So the knowledge of his presence changes the way you do life. He is available. How would that change your life if you knew that and practiced it? He is accessible. How would that change your life if you knew that and practiced it? God is present to me. I am present to God. Not just God is present to me and I am present. I'm always present to God because there's no way I can go to hide from him. You see, the psalm says, if I go to heaven, you're there. If I go down to Sheol, you're there. If I think darkness is going to hide me, you're there. There's no place. Even darkness becomes light to me. There is never a situation where I'm out of your sight. You know, we parents get worried when our children are out of sight. When we don't hear from our kids, when we don't hear from our loved ones, we get worried. God is never worried because there's never a moment when you are out of his sight. That must change and radically alter the way we feel secure. I am present to God, whether I like it or not, I am present to God. And I long for his hand. I long for his strength and I long for his nearness. And now we're, we're getting to what we're really about this morning. God is with us and he wants to be. I am with God even though I don't want to be. But do I really long for his presence? Do I enjoy his presence? Am I hooked on the security and the joy that comes from knowing that I am in the presence of God? You see, the more I understand God's nearness to me, his presence with me, his accessibility, the more I will yearn to live in his presence, the more I will long for it. I will become used to it. I will live by the power of his presence. Psalm 42 verse 1 and 2 uh, gives you that sense of yearning that the psalmist had developed. He said, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. That kind of a thirst for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. My God, uh, my soul thirsts for you, God. My soul thirsts for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? You see that? Do you get that sense? Do you get that sense? Where can I go and meet with God? Psalm 84, he repeats the same kind of thing in verse 1 and 2. He says, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. Even faints? yearns, even faints. Come on, David. What did you know that we don't? What did you experience about the presence of God that we haven't yet? How did you get to a place where you yearn, perhaps even faint, if you haven't been in God's presence? Can that be my reality? Can that be something that I long for as much? Knowing full well, the promises of God that if I were to live in his presence and breathe by his life, his life giving presence, I would not be as frustrated and as empty and as hungry and as desperate and as depressed as I could be in the life that I now live. I know his presence. I know his word. So why can't I understand what God has in store for me? God is present to me and I am present to God. He says, it, I, my soul yearns, even faints. My friend, maybe you've never had a relationship with God or maybe you've been in a relationship with God for many years. Wherever you are today, I want to I want to encourage you and push you a little further into the next step, to the next level of intimacy with God. There is an insatiable hunger that a man in his spirit develops once he is made alive to God. Let me repeat that so you don't miss this. There is an insatiable hunger that a man's spirit develops once he is made alive to God. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news is that man is dead to God. He's born dead to God because sin is present in the world. And because of sin, death came and death separated us from God. 
But Jesus went to the cross and he paid for our sin, which was the cause of our death. So now the cause of death has been removed. So death itself can be reversed. So Jesus paid for it and died and he rose again from the dead. He came alive again. He was resurrected from the dead. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead also gives you and me new life. So we are made alive back to God. We are now alive to God. We were dead to him, but we are now alive to God. Just like you don't talk to dead people. But if they were to be made alive again, you would restore your relationship with them. You have been made alive again so that God can restore his relationship with you. The gospel is about God making us alive again so that we may enter into a relationship with God. And when a man is made alive to God, with that new birth comes new hunger. With that new birth comes new hunger. The baby born immediately cries out for milk. A new, a new believer, a child of God born, born again, immediately cries out for the presence of God. In fact, that hunger for God's presence is a sign that we are alive to God. That hunger that we have, that we uh, express the moment we become alive, that hunger is met with the divine invitation to drink of the well that never runs dry. Can I say that again? That hunger that you have for the presence of God, that insatiable hunger in the, in the spirit of man is met by God with an invitation. You're hungry? Come eat. You're thirsty? Come drink. Come drink of the well that never runs dry. What does that mean? That is an eternal invitation to rest in him. Think, think with me. God brings you to life so that in his life, in a relationship with him, you are invited into an eternal rest, an eternal settling, an eternal sorting, an eternal anchoring in the presence and the permanency and the eternality of God. So our life in God must reflect, must resonate, must uh, radiate that sense of being confident and comforted and settled and rested in God's presence. That is what is the difference between a person who's alive to God and is enjoying his presence and a person who's not enjoying his presence, practicing his presence. This God is the life giver and we are the life recipients. He is the life giver. So he makes us alive to him so that he may breathe life once again. Like Adam, like God breathed into Adam, the breath of life. God breathes into every believer, the breath of new life. And he breathes life and we are the life recipient. Some are saved, but they're not satisfied. Some are saved, but they are not satisfied. You have come to Christ, but you have not drunk from Christ. You have not allowed that life giving breath to breathe into you. See, my brother and my sister, my friend, he breathes into you. He breathes purpose. He breathes meaning. He breathes perspective. He breathes value. He breathes significance into our lives. But you know what he breathes the most? He breathes rest. He breathes rest, rest from worry, rest from anxiety, rest from uncertainty, rest from eternal uh, uh, a, a question or, or, or hopelessness. Those things that a man experiences who is disconnected from God, he rest, he breathes rest into all of those areas. And you recognize that your soul has come home. You recognize and experience that your soul has come home. God has taken you by the hand. That was always the experience. And Jesus is the hand of God. Jesus met with his disciples. And the, and the thing that most resonated about his relationship with, with Jesus, I find that in Mark chapter 6, verse 30 and 34. He says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that had been done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. You thought that God is calling you to work for him. 
You thought that God was calling him to do good works and to earn him his love and to earn his his uh, his approval. But God is calling you to a life of rest. God is a father calling you as a child back into his arms. God is calling you to life so he may breathe the, the living rest of God into you. Into you. I want to challenge you today. If your life and your relationship with God has been a contractual one, if your deal with God has been a good versus bad works deal, if your deal with God has been a judgment versus condemnation deal, if your relationship with God is a distant, cold relationship as one who is watching you to find fault with you, today I invite you into a relationship with God who calls you to rest in him who calls you to take him, take you by the hand and to satisfy you. A father who dotes on you, a father who is present with you and wants you to enjoy and live in the confident that daddy's close by, daddy's around. I urge you, I invite you into that presence with God. So when do we need to hold God's hand the most? When I can't see where I'm going, that's when I need to hold God's hand. When I run out of words and my mind is fighting faith, that's when I need to hold God's hand. When the pain is overwhelming and I just want to hold his hand and cry. When I'm flat on my back and I'm fighting for life. When do we struggle to hold God's hand? When do we find it difficult to hold God's hand? When we hit hard times and we haven't practiced his presence. We're not used to it. We don't know what it feels like. We don't know how to quickly step in to the presence of God. We don't know how to quickly turn our situation into a cathedral of his presence. We are not familiar with his presence and we are more prone to run to man, to money and to medicine for help. That's when we struggle to hold God's hand. Let me tell you about a man who I knew many years ago. And he taught me the power of God's presence. He was a prayerful man and his faith was solid. And his wife was going into labor and we had been praying for his, his family. We had been praying for his wife as she went into labor. We heard that there were some complications. But as the woman lay in, in uh, the labor room, she was in stress and the baby was in stress. And this man was pacing up and down the corridor of the hospital room. This man was pacing up and down the corridors of the hospital. And as he walked up and down, he turned that place into the presence of God. He yearned for God. He called out to God. He rested in God. Long hours of waiting and watching, praying and pleading with God. And then finally he gets news that his wife died while giving birth to the child. And then he hears the, the cry of the baby. Life had turned unfair. Tragic. But his faith reverted to a God whose presence he knew well. His faith reverted to a God whose presence he knew well. He had a place to run to when life turned on him. He knew what to step into. He knew what to grab onto. It was something he had been doing all his life. And I was a young man yet. And as he told us the testimony and, the, and how he walked through this incredibly painful time, I begin to realize that that's not something you learn in that moment. That's something you practice day to day to day so that you run into his presence when the time comes as well. He broke down with confidence in the arms of a God who knew pain firsthand. Did you hear me? He broke down with confidence into the arms of a man who knew pain firsthand. He broke down with confidence into the arms of a God who knew pain firsthand. He was now experiencing pain, but he fell into the arms of a God who always has known what pain feels like. And he came through, he came through strong and he's doing great today. Tragedy will hit. Hard times will come. Death spares no one. Disease and pandemics spare no one. We must know the presence of God. And times will come when all the structures and the support systems that you have 
of worship and fellowship and preaching and in encouragement and all sorts of uh, beautiful verses and, and songs all around you and people around you. The time will come when you will be all alone and you'll have to fight that battle of pain or despair all alone. And in that moment, everything will hinge on your habit of the experience of God's presence. Are you ready? Are you ready for that? In my capacity as your pastor, I must warn you and I must prepare you for that. Life knows no partiality. God's hand is an open offer ever since Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus is the hand of God. To take God by the hand is to take Jesus by his word. Thomas, he said, you doubt? Come, put your finger in my hand and don't doubt, don't doubt. Peter began to sink as he took his eyes off Jesus. Jesus reached out his hand and said, come, grab me by the hand. Why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? To trust Jesus is to place your hand in the hand of God because Jesus is the hand of God. My brothers, my sisters, my friends, we were created for fellowship with God. We were pre created to be close to God. We were created and designed for intimacy with God. You are trying life without being close to God. You run to God only times of need. And those times God seems to let you down. God seems to be far. I'll tell you why. Because when things were okay, you didn't practice his presence. You didn't know what it's like to hold on to him. You were not already uh, addicted to spiritual life. Let me close with challenging you on a few things. How do I hold God's hands to sense his presence? You step out of your weakness into his strength. And you close your eyes to the world around you and wait for him to show up. Can I say that again? Don't miss this. You step out of your weakness, physical, emotional, structural, energy, life, schedules. You step out of your weakness and into his strength. And you close your eyes to the world around you and wait for him to show up. God is spirit and they who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. And then you begin to see the strength of God. In Lamentations, the writer says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new, the mercies, every morning. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, my soul says. Therefore, I will hope in him. See, I won't hope in a God who's not my portion. But the Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait on him. To the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Please stare at that verse one more time. It is good that one should wait patiently, wait quietly for the presence of God. Come, let's close today and let's close with a commitment. What should I believe? I must believe that God's presence is worth pursuing. He is to be waited on and his visitation when he arrives is going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. God's never going to meet you in a hurry. God will always wait to see how serious you are about meeting with him. God is the God of the universe. You make the time. I make the time. What should I focus on? I must focus my thoughts on his promise to be with me in every situation. I must be aware of every promise he's ever made to me. In a love letter, if you knew of all the things that you're loved one has said to you, you wouldn't miss out on a single one and you'd go over it and over it and over it. God has made promises of his presence and I'll make a habit. I'll make a habit of focusing on his promises. What action should I take right now? What does God expect from me right now? Let's make three commitments to habit forming. Shall we do that? I will make a habit of disconnecting from my physical world and connecting with God in quiet prayer, in meditation, in listening to his word. Should we do that again? 
I will make a habit of disconnecting from my physical world and connecting with God in quiet prayer, in meditation and listening to his word. Number two, a second habit. I will make a habit of discussing my thoughts and my intentions with him every hour as I go through my day. As every hour passes, I'm going to make a habit of discussing my thoughts and my intentions with him as I go through the day. Let me give you a third habit forming commitment. I will make a habit of thanking him in the moments of my day. I will make a habit of thanking him in the moments of my day that he is with me, seeing what I'm experiencing and knowing that I need him. Should we do that again? I will make a habit of thanking him in the moments of my day that he is with me, seeing what I'm experiencing and knowing that I need him. I'll make a habit of thanking him. I want you to take this very seriously because this is why Jesus saved you. This is why Jesus hung on the cross. This is why he sent the Holy Spirit. This is why he sent apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors. This is why he put the word of God in your hand so that he may be close to you and he may remind you of his presence and his promises day in, day out, day in, day out. Are you enjoying the presence of God as a habit, as a lifestyle? Do you know what it's like to step out of your reality and into his? Do you know the peace, the centrality that comes from being in God's presence and living off his presence? Are you willing to take that time to step out of your reality and to wait until God visits with you? I want to do it. I encourage you to do it. Let's be people who know the presence of God. Now's our time to give to God his tithes and our offerings. I want to thank you so much for your faithfulness for your generosity. It reflects how much you love Jesus because God is a giver. And whenever we love, we give. And we've seen that in your giving. We've seen that in our faithfulness as a church. Come, let's be generous. Let's be faithful yet again today. As we go into the song, let's prayerfully give to God his tithes and our offerings. As we raise it up, we will dedicate what we are giving to him and say to God, God, this is how grateful I am for life, for strength, for healing. As we raise our offering to God, let's give to God. We call it depositing and dedicating. And today, as we listen to this song, let's deposit our tithes and our offerings into the account. The details are at the bottom of your screen. And as we come out of this song of worship, we will dedicate our offering to God.
Come, let's dedicate what we have just deposited to God. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your provision, Lord. We are grateful. We are grateful. Some are struggling without jobs. Some are struggling, Lord, with with uh, limited resources. But all in all, you are our master and you are the one who provides. And I pray, Lord, that in the company of your people, there would be no need. There would be no one in need. Just like the first century church, we would be sensitive to everyone's need and we would share what God has given to us. We would share what you have blessed us with, Lord, and there would never be anyone who is in need amidst us. Lord, would you do it both ways? Would you bring to our notice those who are in need because they will never tell us. And Lord, would you enable some of us who have dispensable income and are generous and are sacrificial to share what we have. Thank you that we have been able to help people rebuild their homes uh, in the cyclone affected areas. Thank you that we've been held we've been able to help uh, migrants and others who have been displaced with food and with clothing. Thank you that we have been able to do a little bit and even though it's a drop in the bucket, Lord, it is an initiative to show that Lord we want to be part of this. We want to serve, we want to give. We want to be like you, Lord, because you're a giver and you're generous. Father, would you anoint what we have given you and bless it so that it may be useful and it would would need to meet the needs of your people who are serving you here in the church faithfully and would meet the needs of those who are out in the world in need thank you jesus accept our offering in christ's name i pray amen i have an exciting bit of news to tell you tomorrow we launch vacation by the school online and i'm going to be sharing stories with children i'm looking forward to that and i need your prayer as we record those stories and we talk to the children about uh, the bible we're going to do an overview all the way from genesis to revelation and kind of get like an overarching meta narrative understanding of the wonderful gospel of god as he went as he, as he began life and he ends creation uh, and the sun in the end will rise s o n the sun will rise so that's Vacation Bible School 2020, the sun will rise and every morning at nine o'clock, the video will play and the children will watch the video on their own and then they'll join their class in Zoom uh, and there will be, I say about maybe five, six, seven kids along with a couple of our volunteers uh, at about 9.30 and they'll be uh, discussing that story and learning a memory verse. So 15 days, 15 days of learning God's word, learning God's word by heart, pray. pray that children would come alive do you know that most people who give their life to christ give it during between the ages of 5 to 20 most people who come to christ and dedicate their lives to jesus do it between the age of 5 and 20 i gave my life to jesus when i was 5 and i remember saying the prayer i gave my life to serving god when i was 11 when i promised in a missions program that i would serve people for the rest of my life that i would i would serve god and his purposes for the rest of my life so vbs is for ages 6 to 13 and we want to be praying for these children and everything else any other information you want go to jeremydawson.org jeremydawson.org all the information is there and i would love for you to be uh, in prayer for us and uh, it's free and I, i i really hope that it will go global but at least nationwide i hope that english speaking children will be able to join us so please do pray for us and uh, and, and and i'll let, i'll keep you posted on how it's going through the week hi my name is rebecca and i want to invite you to vacation bible school 2020 the theme of our vbs is the sun will rise We will be going on an adventure together as we overview the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Every day at 9 a.m., you will watch a story by Pastor Jerry. After which, you will join your group captain and a few other kids your age in a Zoom class. Please go to the website and register your place. We cannot wait to hear from you. See you at VBS. Come let's close this service. It's been a joy talking about the presence of God, worshiping God and having you online with us. If you were with us for the first time, please there's a link in the comment section. Let us know who you are. Let us know what we can pray for. 
Come join our community. Be part of our church. Become a member of our church. Wherever you live, whichever part of the world, you can be a member of our church and give me an opportunity to shepherd you and look after you and to disciple you in the ways of our, of us, of our Savior. Come, let's close this uh, service today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much for your presence with us. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for the opportunity to give to you. Thank you for the reminder of your presence. Lord, we are dedicated. We are committed to experiencing your presence. Lord, we want to make it a lifestyle of swapping between spiritual and physical, being able to step easily into your cathedral of worship, to your cathedral of your presence. Lord, we want to be people who are well familiar to the point where we yearn, even faint, for the presence of God. That, like the psalmist, we'd be able to say, when, when can I go into the presence of God? When can I run into uh, God's presence? Lord, let that be the reality of our people. To that end, Lord, we ask your blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each and every one of us through this week and even forevermore. It's been a joy being with you today. I hope that you will share what you have heard with others. Uh, subscribe and make sure that you're part of our community online and offline. And if there's anything we can do for you, we're here for you. God bless. Bye-bye. Hi again. Thank you so much for attending the service. We miss you and we really hope to see you soon. Uh, before you leave, please do not forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel and share it with whoever you think will benefit from it. We'll see you next Sunday. Bye-bye.